Hello, KPFA listeners, and welcome to Terra Verde, a public affairs programming cornerstone to KPFA community broadcasting. Our program brings you news, reporting, and updates from around the Bay, around the state, around the country, and indeed around the world, looking closely at a broad array of environmental and social justice issues. My name is Gary Hughes, and I am the host and producer of this episode of Terra Verde. Today we are going to continue with coverage of a very newsworthy climate and energy issue here in the San Francisco Bay Area that has been suffering, for lack of a better term, a pretty serious media blackout. Fortunately, the independence of KPFA allows us to keep our community informed about a critical matter, the proposed conversion of two of the five oil refineries here in the San Francisco Bay Area to processing largely soy-based liquid fuels. Because of coverage, we produced on this issue in January and March of this year, listeners to KPFA Terra Verde may remember that in the summer of 2020, in the throes of the pandemic-induced commodity markets crash, both Phillips 66 and the Marathon Petroleum Company announced the pivot of their North San Francisco Bay refineries to manufacturing largely soy-based drop-in diesel and alternative jet fuels. Worth noting is that because of what the industry calls demand destruction, essentially the collapse of market demand for their product, the Marathon Martinez refinery closed down completely in August 2020 and is currently not processing any fuel whatsoever, serving only as a fuel storage and distribution center. As the pandemic shutdown intensified last year, the Phillips 66 refinery in Rodeo also curtailed their production significantly, but was able to avoid a complete shutdown. For climate activists with years of battling with the oil industry, the inevitable decommissioning of these dirty energy facilities loomed large on the horizon, except that the pivot to high deforestation risk commodity biofuels suddenly offered a means by which these companies might be able to wiggle their way out of actually being held accountable for these stranded and increasingly problematic assets. Using their rebirth as biofuel manufacturers to publicly reveal to the world their concern about climate change and their fresh commitment to supposedly renewable energy, both companies have moved aggressively with land use authorities and Contra Costa County to secure permitting for the unprecedented conversion of their refineries to biofuels. As it turns out, on the exact same day in mid-October, literally within 30 minutes of each other, the draft environmental impact reports for both projects were released, unleashing a torrent of documentation on a concerned community with a deadline for public comment set for December 17th. As a matter of full disclosure, I am a member of the KPFA Terra Verde Collective, and I also currently work as the California Policy Monitor for the organization Biofuel Watch, an international organization which is actively engaging in the refinery conversion issue to build public participation and demand scrutiny of the technical and narrative details of these projects. To that end, Biofuel Watch is one of a key selection of organizations that are sponsoring an online community meeting at 7 p.m. on Monday, November 15th. You can find more information by going to the website of the Sunflower Alliance at sunflower-alliance.org. And in the spirit of a community meeting, today's KPFA Terra Verde features two brief interviews with two distinct guests who, though they are regularly collaborating together, joined me for different interview sessions this past week to look closer at the release of the draft environmental impact reports for these two proposed refinery conversions. Later in the show, we will hear from Greg Karras, who has been on KPFA before to share his expertise in refinery matters and the environmental and public health impacts of different energy systems. Greg publishes regular findings from his monitoring of the liquid fuels energy sector in California on his website, which you can find at energy-re-source.com. 
We will hear from Greg about why Bay Area residents and especially frontline communities near these facilities should have some real concerns about public safety and the lack of disclosure from the companies about what is being proposed with the refinery conversions. As well, Greg has some great research to share about how it is that the pivot to biofuels in California is not really replacing fossil fuels and that the growing export of refined fuels from the refinery sector in California to foreign markets shows that when it comes to climate, a pivot to biofuels in the San Francisco Bay Area is just throwing fuel on the fire. We will hear from Greg later in the show. Our first guest is Anne Alexander, who is an attorney and policy advocate with the Natural Resources Defense Council, working as a litigator with the NRDC Nature Program's Dirty Energy Team. Anne has had a crucial role working with local residents and a broad array of Bay Area national and international organizations who are concerned about these proposed conversions of refineries to biofuels and who believe that the public health and climate benefits of these projects may very simply not be as green as they seem. Anne and I spoke in detail about the draft environmental review documentation and the importance of public participation in these unprecedented matters. And thank you so much for joining me on KPFA Terra Verde. As we get started, could you just quickly introduce yourself and describe your position with NRDC and tell us a little bit about the Dirty Energy Team? Yes, my name is Anne Alexander, and I'm a senior attorney with the Dirty Energy Team, which is a part of NRDC's nature program. And specifically what the Dirty Energy Team does, as the name kind of implies, is we focus on fossil fuels and more specifically on what we call the supply side of fossil fuels, not the part where people consume them, but the taking them out of the ground, transporting them, and refining them. And can you describe some of your ongoing expertise with refinery issues? What are some other instances that you have worked to help elevate local community engagement with refinery sector developments and and even expansions? Well, that's actually uh, an interesting question because my first real case with NRDC joined about 14 years ago uh, had to do with the refinery. I was at the Chicago office at the time. Um, And there was a refinery, is a refinery in Whiting, Indiana, uh, that was looking to expand and retool in order to take tar sands crude. This was obviously a huge concern on multiple levels for the community and for really the whole advocacy community in Chicago. Here in California, where I have been for roughly four years, I've become involved in particular with a, a a coalition that focuses on refinery transitions. In other words, the idea which um, has been playing out that um, refineries are not going to be here forever um, and you need to help the communities that are affected by their transition either out of existence or to something else like biofuels. So you bring a great deal of experience with refineries to this community-based work. And as you mentioned, really looking at this inevitable decommissioning of these facilities. But here in California, you're having to work a great deal with the California Environmental Quality Act. Can you describe really quickly what makes this such an important bedrock environmental law for protecting public participation in decision making? Absolutely. The idea of the California Environmental Quality Act flows actually from a federal law that's been in place since 1969 called the National Environmental Policy Act. And the idea is that before, it's a look before you leave law. It's the idea that anytime government is making a decision about something that is likely to have significant environmental impacts, they need to scrutinize it very closely. And over time, a lot of definition has grown around both the California law and, and the federal law about what that kind of scrutiny entails. But what is what is unique about California's law that doesn't exist uh, in the federal version is that in California, you are not only required to identify ways that you could mitigate impacts, make them less severe, but if you can, you're required to implement that mitigation. In other words, it's not just an analytical law. It has a mandatory component of requiring that you make your project environmentally better if you can. 
So in easy terms, the CEQA process happens in steps. There's a scoping, then there's a release of a draft environmental impact report, then the final environmental impact report, and then finally that EIR is certified or approved by the lead agency. In, in this instance, the refinery conversions that we're discussing, uh, the most responsible authority is Contra Costa County. Now, the scoping happened earlier this year. And many people had heard that the draft EIR for the Marathon Refinery project was going to be released. But then suddenly in uh, October, just a couple of weeks ago, both projects uh, saw their draft environmental impact report documentation released uh, almost, well, basically simultaneously. Uh, this is a lot of work suddenly that's on people's plate. Can you give us some impressions of how, you know, the quality of these DEIRs, the draft documentation, is responding to community concerns? And then could you also then address this question that's so central to CEQA about the issue of cumulative impacts and whether the environmental impact review is adequately addressing these questions of the, you know, two massive refineries making this pivot? Well, I'm first of all going to completely agree with you that it's a lot of work, um, but it's also an opportunity because one of the great things about CEQA is it takes seriously the idea of public input. And right now, is, as you referenced, uh, we have just gotten the draft environmental impact reports, the, these reports being essentially where the analysis occurred. There is a period of time in which the public can submit comments on those drafts um, that ends on December 17th. And then once the comments are in, before the lead agency puts out a final environmental impact report, they have to respond to all those comments. And that means seriously respond to them, not just thank you for sharing. So it's really the public's opportunity to have a say about these reports. Now, uh, you asked about first of all, their quality, um, that's an interesting question because in the scoping process that happened earlier this year, we spent a lot of time uh, putting together comments that defined for the agency just you know, how, the, the range of issues that it's very important to look at in something like a biofuel conversion. It's not just a question of looking at what comes out of the smokestack, although that's important, but you have to look at the entire impact um, and you have to make sure that you're measuring that impact in an appropriate way. So one of the issues that we raised um, of particular importance was the question of what are you using or what are the refineries going to use for their feedstock? They're not going to be using crude, but they really hadn't defined what else they were going to use. And they had made reference to the idea of using waste oil, you know, what's, what's left over after McDonald's cooks the French fries, but there isn't enough French fry oil in the world uh, to run even one biofuel refinery. So the question is, what are you going to use? And then the probable answer to that, it's increasingly appearing, is that you use food crops. You use things like soy oil and maybe corn oil that are also used in foods, um, which leads to the question, which we asked of the agency, what happens when you suddenly dip into those food crop supplies and start hoovering them up for not one, but two, and possibly many more biofuel projects? What is going to be the impact on land use, on food prices, on increased use of other oils that are very destructive, like palm oil? We don't have the answers, but we certainly have the questions. So we asked that question. Um, and then we asked the question of, essentially, okay, these refineries are claiming that they're going to reduce their impact because they're going to be producing less and they're going to be doing it more nicely, as it were. Um, but that presumes that if they didn't get the permit, that the, the status quo of crude refining would continue. But the problem is that doesn't appear to really map onto reality because the actual status quo is one of these refineries was closed at the time they proposed to do this. And one of the refineries was taking steps, suggesting they were winding down their operations. So we asked that question, too, about, you know, what we call the baseline, where you start calculating from. 
And we asked a lot of other questions about community safety, um, et cetera. The long and the short of it is not to put too fine a point on it, but they ignored most of that. Um, the drafts, although they are hundreds and hundreds of pages long and quite the slog to read through, simply don't address these issues that we think are absolutely critical um, to reviewing the projects. And then in addition to that, uh, you brought up the concept of cumulative impacts. That is tremendously important because part of the look before you leave is saying not just what's this one project going to do to the environment in isolation, but how is it going to work in conjunction with all of the other similar projects in the region um, that are going to be having similar impacts? So in this case, you've got two refineries practically on each other's doorstep doing exactly the same environmentally impactful thing. And these two draft environmental impact reports issued essentially the same day can't barely mention the other project. Um, I would almost have to characterize that as weird in light of the very clear sequel law that you need to consider impacts in conjunction. They simply did. In each one, there's essentially a paragraph about the other refinery out of, as I mentioned, hundreds of pages, and then they just dropped the ball. So we're very concerned with that and are going to be addressing that in comments. Well, I thank you very much for coming on to KPFA Terra Verde and sharing that with us. As, as we wrap this up, do you have any last words for listeners about asserting our rights to have a say in these decisions? Well, I guess a couple of related answers to that. First of all, persistence. Um, it's very important, perhaps goes without saying, but your comments really do matter. Uh, public officials, when they receive a comment, I think generally assume that there are probably hundreds of people out there who care but didn't submit a comment. So when you take the trouble, it really makes a difference. Well, that's great advice. And thank you so much for joining us on Terra Verde. Thank you for having me. You are listening to Terra Verde on KPFA. My name is Gary Hughes, and I am your host today. We just heard from Ann Alexander of the Natural Resources Defense Council about the CEQA process guiding the review of these proposed refinery conversions to biofuels. Our next guest is Greg Karras. Greg is currently an independent consultant. He has more than 30 years of experience providing technical analysis and review of energy sector developments with a special focus on industrial and public safety concerns. Greg has been working hard to decipher the realities of both the Phillips 66 Rodeo Renewed Project and the Marathon Martinez Refinery Renewable Fuels Project. It is great to get Greg on to KPFA to learn more from him about some public safety concerns about the proposed refinery conversions and also to discuss his recent analysis of data regarding diesel fuel manufacture in the state and the increasing amounts of fuel being exported to foreign markets. Thanks for joining Terra Verde for this quick interview. You have so much experience with the facilities in the refinery corridor in the North San Francisco Bay Area. Let's get straight to the essence of why we wanted to get you on the air this week. These refinery conversions are not as climate friendly as many proponents, including in local, state, and federal governments, will, will make them sound. You were one of the first people to really identify the reliance on fossil gas in the proposed hydro processing refinery technology. So can you tell us about exactly what it is that these refineries are proposing to do and how is it that the greenhouse gas emissions from processing and manufacturing these drop-in diesel and alternative jet fuels could actually be as high or higher than the processing of petroleum. They're proposing to put the animal and vegetable oils into uh, their existing hydro processing train. And so that's like petroleum refining um, with a very similar density oil um, at the refinery itself. Uh, but the big difference is that the, the, the hydrogen is used both to change the hydro hydrocarbons so that there's more hydrogen per carbon, you know, turn thick gunk into light jet fuel diesel. Um, and 
It's also used to remove contaminants. The thing is that these animal vegetable oils have way more of the kind of contaminants that have to be removed for the oils to burn right as fuels. So they use way more hydrogen. And that hydrogen has many problems with it. The first one is that it's made using fossil gas, like you say, methane and other gases. It emits 10 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of hydrogen produced. It's about the most GHG intensive or carbon intensive type of processing in the refinery, actually. And it would increase dramatically. So these refineries, uh, these so-called biofuel refineries, when they're using this technology, would be um, more carbon intensive uh, than the average petroleum refinery. But all of this processing also carries with it some pretty significant public health and safety concerns. Uh, you're speaking about the you know, securing of hydrogen from fossil gas and the massive amounts of hydrogen that are necessary to, to make fuels from these vegetable oils and, and other feedstocks. But you've also identified then some other real risks in this type of processing that you know, local residents and other folks should be really attentive to. Can you describe some of these yeah. public health and safety concerns? It's not only fossil fuel hydrogen. It's being used in a dangerous and polluting way. Bonding hydrogen with the contaminants in the oil and with the carbon itself is a highly exothermic reaction. It generates its own heat. In petroleum refining, the temperature runaways, which cause and have caused deadly explosions and fires in the high pressure, high temperature, hydro treating, hydro cracking units. They've killed workers. Uh, they, they have uh, burned down parts of refineries, fires after explosions that burn for days. Um, this has happened repeatedly. And the industry, of course, tries to protect its assets. So they, they, ha they set them up, they build it so that they dump their content suddenly to flares when these runaways happen. At the two refineries in the Bay Area, where the biggest projects of this kind ever proposed or built to date are now proposed, this, they dumped their contents to flares 100 times in the last 10 years. That's like every month or two. They're, it's going to be much more hydrogen intensive with the, the new feedstock that they need to make these biofuels, and that's going to make it worse. And it's already a huge environmental injustice. Right on. Let's get into that a little bit more. I mean, this question of greenwashing, uh, the idea of these refineries being promoted as a climate solution, but really foisting, uh, you know, really dangerous industrial process on communities that have having, you know, have been having to live with these processes for a while. Uh, do you think that the county authorities and their uh, overseeing of the environmental impact the environmental review of these refineries is, is actually giving these issues the scrutiny that they deserve? No. And that's just straight there just to know. And you've taken a good look now at the uh, draft environmental impact reports for both the Phillips 66 project and the Marathon project. Um, do you, I mean, are they really just skirting the issue altogether or are they in any way at all uh, addressing these concerns about the um, public risks and climate dangers of relying on fossil gas for processing of these biofuels? No, they're ducking the issues. And I'd like to say a bit about that really briefly. Please. Um, the industry is, is dealing with a stranded assets problem. These two refineries in particular, one of them is crude starved because of the way it was built. It doesn't have access to the uh, current supplies of crude that are available and the ones that it was built for are drying up. They're dwindling. It's closing anyway. The other one already closed. And um, the uh, industry is, is holding their workers hostage and they are also... Um, pushing government agencies, sort of intimidating them, I would say, to daring them to, to say no to biofuels, which they are um, spreading the word or the, you know, this type of biofuels, the solution. It turns out, and this is a fact that's backed up by the state's most detailed data, uh, that this type of diesel biofuel is proposed here has not, and I repeat, has not been replacing petroleum fuels that it's supposed to replace. 
Now they appear to be incorporating this type of biofuel into their business model, not just to uh, protect their stranded assets, but to expand their exports. This has been demonstrated by the data. Nobody in government is talking about it. They have the data. They seem to be afraid to talk about it. We need to tell the truth about this. This is the wrong solution. It hasn't been replacing fossil fuels, a, a huge environmental injustice, and it creates refining that's more carbon intensive than petroleum refining. That's the fact. And California is the predominant refining center on the West Coast of, 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 of the U.S. and actually in Western North America. So it could become the gas station, the Pacific Rim. Right now, over the last 10, 15 years or so, um, the exports have grown to, uh, depending on how you count them, roughly 30 to 40 percent of the refining here. Uh, we first noticed this, as, and I first noticed this as an environmental just injustice to the communities that live around the refineries and are poisoned by them. Um, and, you know, 30, 40 percent, basically a third of all the health impacts and early deaths from that pollution or for fuels that California doesn't even need or use. They're exported to other states and nations. Um, but the threat is that it keeps going. We're all in some dysfunctional future driving electric vehicles here in California. And, and meanwhile, our, our oil industry is, is actually the, the gas station for the whole Pacific Rim with three, four billion people, um, not, three, not 30 million people um, locked into using its products. That's a recipe for climate chaos that um, also needs to be talked about. Climate chaos is the um, word for it, Greg. This is such an important conversation. Just a really brief interview to have you on KPFA, Terra Verde. Do you have any last words for listeners about how to stay engaged on these issues or why this is such an important issue for the San Francisco Bay Area climate community to mobilize on? Well, thank you, Gary Hughes, and thank you, KPFA, uh, for spreading the world word right when it counts. This is not a done deal yet. These are the, these are the biggest and second biggest uh, projects of their kind ever proposed or built anywhere. They are still in public review. Communities that they're in review in communities and by communities who have stopped tar sands refining projects at these ref refineries in the past. And now we have a chance. There's a meeting coming up in a couple weeks uh, and here's a, a email RSVP for the Zoom link to this meeting that's happening on November 15th in the evening. Action at sunflower-alliance.org. Action at sunflower-alliance.org. All right, Greg. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'll definitely be looking to get you back on Terra Verde so we can keep the public informed about these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. That brings us to the end of this episode of Terra Verde. My name is Gary Hughes. I have been your host today. Thanks so much for tuning in. And thanks to Greg Carrison and Alexander for joining me for this show. You can find this show and others archived on the kpfa.org webpage, where you can also make a safe and secure donation to KPFA by following the donate button at the top of the page. Don't miss the upcoming community meeting on the refinery conversions. On November 15th at 7 p.m., there will be a webinar hosted by Sunflower Alliance and others. You can get info and register by going to sunflower-alliance.org. Thanks again for listening to Terra Verde and for supporting KPFA. Be sure to tune in again next Friday at 2 p.m. for our next episode. Have a great afternoon and a fantastic weekend. Ninety-four point one in Berkeley, eighty-nine point three KPFB in Berkeley, eighty-eight point one KFCF in Fresno, and ninety-seven point five K two four eight BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. It's time for pushing limits.